to my sweetheart. This book contains many beautiful love poems, but none can match in beauty and splendor the love you've given to me. This book is full of poems that inspire, but none can compare to the way you inspire. I search for this book. I do it instinctively. Somewhere on this shelf, stacked among the others, is a collection of W. H. Auden poetry I bought in a secondhand bookstore. I visit bookstores wherever I go as a way of mapping the place, the time, and then promptly forget where and when I found each one. Now in this time we are calling unprecedented. I go looking for this particular book of poems. Unprecedented. But in poetry, nothing is really unprecedented. Poetry is the country of the human experience. All sorrows and joys have lived there before. So right now, when we are alone, alone together, isolated everywhere, if there's one place we can still travel, it's into the words of others who have lived through life's great cruelties. Let's meet there. I'm Carmel Michael, and this is Hyacinth Podcast, where we ponder beauty, anger, love, loss, fear, glory, and the unbreakable heart of human living. I'm making this episode from my little home studio. It's April, 2020. And our very human hearts are being tested now, broken and remade with every day's headlines. So this episode is a love letter, a love letter for difficult times, a kind of gentle way of being with, being together, even when we must be distanced apart. I'm going to share some of the things I've been reading during this crisis that, for me, feel like a love letter to us all. But the kind of letter written in wartime, sent across borders and oceans in conflict, flown above it all, and placed into the hands of someone who loves and is loved. Think about the magic of that. The way all the small and private intimacies of human life persist and even thrive in times of major upheaval. And sure, at times like this, things like beauty and poetry might seem frivolous. Love letters too small, poems too tired, other things we write with our hearts like little prayers might feel futile. And yes, these are small things, very small things. But here's what British American poet W. H. Auden says about poetry. He wrote this in 1939, when World War II was just beginning, for poetry makes nothing happen. It survives. In the valley of its making where executives would never want to tamper, flows south from ranches of isolation and the busy griefs, raw towns that we believe and die in. It survives. A way of happening. A mouth. And Maria Popova, in her recent book called Figuring, says that, quote, Art cannot be some lofty chandelier dangling above life, but must draw its light from the plane of living. Art is an instrument of truth and transformation for the human heart, and through it, for the body of the world. The body of our world is suffering right now, for sure. But Popova goes beyond the body. She writes that human imagination both comforts us and helps us create new possibilities in times of great uncertainty. In New Orleans, there is a World War II museum where you can read thousands of letters, love letters, written during the war. Urgent handwriting scrawled across yellowed pages, deeply creased and worn where they've been folded for decades. In these letters, you read it all, from the enraptured, the passionate, the desperate, to the overpromised and unrequited. 
There's a New York Times article about this from just this past February. In it, the assistant director of collections at the museum, Tony Kaiser, says that these letters, quote, show how the unpredictability and horror of war compelled people to gush about their feelings, forsaking fears of rejection or humiliation. What an idea that something as terrible as unbelievably inhumane as World War II could in some ways make people more bravely human. Even I, as a writer, so practiced at solitude, it's really a daily occupational hazard for most writers, even I miss all the mess, the noise of everyday life, the taste of a draft beer, the buzz of Saturday night, Sundays at my favorite cafe, hands held across tables, newspapers passed between couples who trade sections and split a pastry. Monday mornings, the streets lined with cars waiting for lights to change, that precarious patience we've all trained ourselves into in order to uphold a thousand other precarious systems of commerce, economy, of simply getting along. An article from the Harvard Business Review that was making the rounds a week or two ago is called That Discomfort You're Feeling is Grief. Mixed in with all the direct and very real grief of those who are losing loved ones right now is the other collective grief, a general sense of losing whatever we so recently called normal. In her memoir, H is for Hawk, Helen MacDonald writes, The archaeology of grief is not ordered. It's more like earth under a spade, turning up things you had forgotten. Even if, like me, you are currently safe and healthy, away from the quote-unquote front line, this moment is probably turning up some stuff for you. Fears and anxieties, maybe. But here I am in my safe little home, writing this letter to you. And I'm so grateful for this perfectly acerbic bit of writerly wisdom from Annie Dillard's famous essay, The Writing Life. Really, I try to read this thing at least once a month during normal times just to keep things in perspective. It goes like this. Putting a book together is interesting and exhilarating. It is life at its most free. The averse of this freedom, of course, is that your work is so meaningless so fully for yourself alone, and so worthless to the world that no one except you cares whether you do it well or ever. Your freedom is a byproduct of your day's triviality. A shoe salesman, who is doing others' tasks, who must answer to two or three bosses, who must do his job their way, and must put himself in their hands at their place during their hours, is nevertheless working usefully. Further, if the shoe salesman fails to appear one morning, someone will notice and miss him. Your manuscript, on which you lavish such care, has no needs or wishes. It knows you not. Nor does anyone need your manuscript. Everyone needs shoes more. Of course, this is true now more than ever. No one needs this letter. Everyone needs nurses, doctors, delivery drivers, grocery store workers, caregivers, scientists, leaders, parents. The people quietly going about keeping the world running while many of us hide as we should in our living rooms. But of course, we do need writing and art and music and all those things that make our hearts beat. We need it the same as we need love letters during war. I've been reading the biography of T.H. White. He is the British author who wrote The Once and Future King. Now, I don't usually gravitate toward this genre at all. It's based on the medieval legend of King Arthur. But it turns out that White was a fascinating, though somewhat tragic sort of person. Born in 1906, he had a violent and traumatic childhood. And although he was a successful writer with a circle of literary friends, he spent most of his life alone. As a way to cope with a near-constant sense of general fear, he ran headfirst into the things that terrified him. He was scared of flying, so he became a pilot. He trained himself as a falconer, a gardener, an oil painter. 
After he died in 1964, his longtime friend L.J. Potts said of him, He was far more remarkable than anything he wrote. Considering the fact that he wrote one of the most popular books of the 20th century, I'd say that's pretty good. But here's why I think T.H. White is relevant right now. Sometime in the mid-1940s, White's dog named Brownie passed away. Now, Brownie had been his most trusted and sole companion for over a decade. In a letter to a friend, White wrote this, Brownie was my life, and I'm lonely for just such another reservoir for my love. But if I did get such a reservoir, it would die in about 12 years, and at present I feel I couldn't face that. Do people get used to being bereaved? This is my first time. That question. It's so real and human and vulnerable and sort of naive. White was writing this during the final throes of the Second World War, a time of immense devastation. So in context, the loss of his dog feels trivial. But that's the thing. It's not. It's not at all. Loss is loss, and the singular pain of losing does coexist with big shared losses. Right now, both kinds of losses are happening at the same moment, all around the world, every day. A recent New York Times article profiled two women, Eva Kolish and Naoma Replansky, who have both lived through the Spanish flu, the Great Depression, the Holocaust, and now this pandemic. Perhaps as some form of answer to T.H. White's question, do people get used to being bereaved, Times writer Genia Belafonte says, When catastrophe is sequential, it eventually trains its survivors to greet terror with the serenity of the enlightened. It's an odd kind of training to want, catastrophe training, but I think many of us are wanting it more and more these days. Resilience. And so I trust the instinct that draws me always to a stack of books when things get bad. I seek the wisdom of others who've lived before, who've lived differently and especially harder than I have, who've lived through the world's great cruelties, and who still knew joy, who still loved, who were more bravely human. So I bought my copy of Auden's Collected Poems, the one I go seeking on my bookshelf. I mostly buy all my poetry books that way, I just like the idea of it books lived in by others and passed between hands. Of course, right now, sharing a book feels nostalgic, nearly impossible. But as chance would have it, inside the front cover on the first page is a letter, a love letter. It's written quite carefully in pencil, and it begins, To my sweetheart, and ends, All my love, Jeremy. Where is Jeremy now? Where is his sweetheart? Why do we give away books with love letters written inside them? How did it find its way to me? I don't know. But at this particularly lonely time in the world, I'm unabashedly grateful for it. I went looking for poetry, and I found a love letter. It turns out it's exactly the reminder I needed that even in times of real difficulty, Little words, put neatly one next to the other, in such a particular way, can become so full of life and love and beauty that they might just be enough to get us through this. My sweetheart, this book contains many beautiful love poems, but none can match in beauty and splendor the love you've given to me. This book is full of poems that inspire, but none can compare to the way you've inspired me. 
I can't express how grateful I am that you've come into my life. All my love, Jeremy. This has been Hyacinth Podcast, a love letter for difficult times. For references to all the books and articles I mentioned in this episode, visit hyacinthpodcast.com or connect on social media at Hyacinth Podcast. I'm Carmel Michael. Thank you for listening. Stay well and talk real soon. Mm